I'd like to move on to some contributions now from the Dundee University postgraduate students. Now, these are all recorded, um, but I'm really delighted to say, we're really delighted to say that lots of the um, Harry Langdale, Connor McKinley, Yash Park, Lucy Styles, Martin Walker and Gemma Watson are, you know, I think they're almost all here this evening um, in the meeting. And they're just going to have a state of the art of review in relation to walking cycling, looking at the psychology of fear, natural surveillance, public lighting, electric bikes, overcoming hills, unbroken walking cycling, um, broken walking cycling network and street space reallocation so this is recorded but you know put your thoughts in the chat this is the chat's proving really helpful as to what people think and stuff so thank you good evening we're delighted to be able to share this presentation with you tonight we are from the university of dundee and are all msc students undertaking spatial planning with sustainable urban design and as you'll hear we all found our way to this course from a wide variety of backgrounds by reflecting on our studies into the 20 minute neighbourhood in the city of Perth, Scotland, we will share some of our thoughts and observations on walking and cycling to railway stations. So just a little bit about my background, I've spent 10 years in private practice. I currently work in a local authority supporting the delivery of major projects and I'm a part time MSc student. The 20 minute neighbourhood has been making headlines. It's become a buzzword. It has different brands in different parts of the world, the 15 minute city in Paris, the 20 minute neighbourhood in Portland and Melbourne and the superblocks in Barcelona. 20 minute neighbourhoods are places where residents can meet their daily needs by walking, wheeling or public transport close to their home. Daily needs include things like shopping and services, accessing green space, education, healthcare and employment opportunities. The potential benefits include improved health and well-being, local wealth building, community cohesion, a reduction in carbon emissions and uh, in mitigating the impact of climate change. And why now? Well, there's the backdrop of the climate emergency. All eyes will actually be on Glasgow at COP26 later this year. We're at the start of a very difficult conversation around public space. Who's it for? Who does it represent and celebrate? the ongoing pandemic and the inequalities that are experienced in society. And to unpack that COVID piece just a little, COVID has offered the opportunity for testing new ideas and offers some temporary behaviour change. We've seen things like pop-up cycle lanes. Everyone has spent more time at home and many have had the chance to reconnect with their neighbourhood. And some people are really benefiting from that, getting their commuting time back, being able to drop off kids at school, go for a run, essentially being offered a new work-life balance, a new way of living. And for others, it's not so good. And the COVID spotlight really has shown us how much inequality exists in society. So many don't have access to adequate housing, don't have access to green space and suffer the health inequalities. And finally, COVID also might create a reluctance for us to go back to using public transport in this new world we're living in. A 15 minute city or a 20 minute neighbourhood the times are somewhat arbitrary because we all walk and move at different speeds. A 12 year old biking alone, a parent with a double buggy, someone who's visually impaired or has mobility issues, they're going to have a, a, a smaller 15 minute city or 20 minute neighbourhood. So what's important is that these distances are safe, they're continuous, they're comfortable and positive and manageable experiences to cover the distance. Destination is also key. We need positive and attractive destinations, but we also need to consider how far people will walk. Studies show people are prepared to walk less distance for a bus stop or a corner shop, but further to work. This must be considered when planning links and connections to public transport hubs. And maybe this is what a 20 minute neighbourhood could look like. This is taken after the diagram drawn by Dr Yang, looking at it in a Scottish context in the city of Perth where we've looked at that paths for all data showing us how far people are prepared to walk for something and also the numbers of people and the sort of services that they might expect. So the bus stop, the play area, the green amenity and the local shop are very close to home. But further on, a regional transport like could be 20 minutes away. And it's our observation that Perth should be and could be a 20 minute neighbourhood from the outer edges. We can cycle comfortably within 20 minutes to the city centre and the city centre itself is, is very walkable. And the final part about making a, a 20 minute neighbourhood is about 
density and intensity. We need the numbers of people, but we also need the mix of housing. We need different people, different generations, and we need the volume of people to support the services, including transport, um, that people need. And we need to look cleverly at these things. We need to think about hubs and overlapping neighbourhoods and shared neighbourhood facilities to make these things work so that they're sustainable and remain distant within distances that we want to walk and destinations that we want to go to. And this is Perth, how it's grown from 1860 in the first image, right up to 2020, where the population has only actually increased by 17,000. It's our observation that the 20 minute neighbourhood could provide the framework to increase travel, active travel to and from railway stations. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Yash Parker. I'm from an architectural background and currently I'm working on my research on the understanding of experiences of streets. Today I'll be talking on the transport networks and their significance in response to walking and cycling to and from railway stations. Often, the transport systems exist as broken networks of cycling and walking routes. To improve the share of people using rail and bus transit, these networks should be developed as continuous systems, seamlessly connecting the users with their destinations through safe travel options. This will connect neighborhoods and city cores to places of work, study, and leisure. Discontinuity in transport is caused by contextual situations, for example, the gradient and the distribution of services across the city making it difficult for an equal, comfortable access by users of all age, abilities, and gender. To function effectively, the transport network should be designed such that they are accessible to all, frequent and convenient as per the needs, and connected to all the places of interest. Various measures can be undertaken to respond to such issues. At an urban scale, the routes of walking and cycling should be made continuous. As example, Copenhagen currently has 375 kilometers of dedicated cycling lanes. By 2018, the use of cars reduced from 35% to 32%. Another tactical measure is to include mobility hubs at strategic locations. By integrating various transport modes, these hubs provide transit options to the user to suit their needs. They also act as a shared resource that is supported by nearby services and promote green travel. In situations where slopes add a challenge to connecting places, public elevators can provide a safe and inclusive alternative. In Bilbao, this is used as an advantage to, to cover the 27 meter height gradient, thereby connecting the nearby neighborhoods with the metro station. With an initial investment, this project delivers cost saving in longer run as compared to development of private and public transit between these spaces. At a strategic level, the travel can be further enhanced by integrating modes through policy. In Copenhagen, users can carry cycles into the metro, which has resulted in a 49% of total work and educational travel done through bicycles. Currently, there are several infrastructural opportunities such as park and ride facilities across Scotland. However, they are focused mainly on connecting public transport with motorized movement. Through the development of continuous networks of cycling and walking routes, these can be transformed to incorporate such active travel options. As seen in Netherlands, the train station promotes bicycle use through spaces for 22,000 bicycle storage. Because of an integrated approach, almost 50% of the train users commute to the stations through bicycles. In conclusion, the cities need to develop travel networks that are continuous and well connected with an inclusive design approach to make them available for everyone. Thus, generating travel routes that are accessible, efficient and safe for all. And this can be done through a holistic development between networks, their supporting infrastructure and an inclusive experience based design implemented across different scales. Hello, I'm Gemma and my background is in sociology and social and public policy. I'm interested in inclusive planning and design, access to cycling and placemaking. And today I'm going to talk about cycling as a lived experience. In order to improve cycling infrastructure around railway stations, we need to think of how we can better enable and promote cycling in general. It's a way of life. It's a method of movement which can bring with it health and social benefits. And then there's the freedom which comes with picking up your bike and going wherever you please. People tend to resist change and they'll not start cycling because a couple of cycle lanes have been added where they live. We need to consider how we can improve the social, spatial and sensory experience of cycling alongside physical changes to encourage people to give it a go. 
In terms of the social aspects of cycling, we should consider how cyclists interact with each other and other road users. Cycle hubs are great because they give people a place to park up their bike, grab a coffee and rest, or have a chat with other cyclists. Shower and changing facilities also help people to feel more comfortable cycling longer distances. Integrating cycling with public transport can make cycling for leisure more popular. For example, the bicycle trains in Stuttgart, Germany are hugely popular. They only cover a small distance of about two kilometres, but they allow cyclists an alternative to cycling uphill. Sensory factors include how comfortable the bike is, how safe you feel and what is in your field of vision. Continuous protected cycle lanes make people feel more secure and being able to see clearly for a long distance allows them to cycle a little bit faster if they're in a rush. Paving surfaces should not change height because that is less comfortable, especially when your bike has very little suspension. Examples of fun and vibrant cycle paths can be seen in the north of Poland, where they are glow in the dark. Uh, they use the synthetic material phosphor, which is charged by sunlight and makes a path glow at night. The spatial experience is about how people navigate and locate cycle lanes. Temporary measures are a good way of engaging people and helping to make cycle routes more visible and consistent. This could be reallocating road space or installing pop-up parklets. Clear signposts help to avoid people taking a wrong turn and ending up on a busy road, which isn't safe. One of the best ways of coming up with designs is to hold competitions. Some of the most innovative ideas have come from local authorities competing against each other to become the most cycling friendly area. We Are Cycling UK say that the three most important methods for increasing cyclist numbers are providing opportunities for people to learn, fix and ride their bicycles. The theory is that people need the capability, opportunity and motivation to change. Not everyone knows how to ride a bike correctly. Teaching people where to position themselves on the road, how to be courteous to others on mixed use roads and general bike maintenance is essential. Therefore, interactive bike repair stations, skill centres and shops should be interspersed along all major routes. I'm going to talk about a couple of case studies now. Copenhagen has historically had issues with creating enough parking for the increasing demand at its railway stations. So a design company called Copenhagen Eyes produced a design for over 7,000 parking spots at Copenhagen Central Station, making use of the space above the railway tracks. It includes ramps down to the platforms and a bike shop for servicing, and it's one of many being considered by the city of Copenhagen, highlighting their commitment to connecting cycling with rail travel. Super Killen is a park which was designed specifically to bring refugees and locals together in one of the most ethnically diverse areas of Copenhagen. The park is described as a highly walkable experience and it includes a well-maintained bike path, bike parking and cafe space. Since it was built, pedestrian and cycling activity has increased due to its stimulating environment which encourages people to be more active. So I've talked about some successful design ideas but there are also many design fails. For example, cycle lanes have been placed in the middle of busy carriageways, which is a safety issue. Bike lockers have been installed in some cities which are too small and cycle racks are sometimes located too close to buildings or roads, meaning that the front wheel either doesn't fit or is protruding into the road. Cycleways which intersect with tram lines and trees can be a serious safety issue, especially when it's raining or icy. In the 50s, a town called Stevenage was seen as a trailblazer in high quality joined up cycling infrastructure. It provided 12 foot wide cycleways and 7 foot wide pavements. However, the majority of residents still chose to drive. The master plan projected that 40% of residents would cycle and just 16% would drive. However, today only 3% of residents cycle and many are still unaware that they have a 23 mile cycle network. The issue is that the town has an easy to follow high capacity traffic system. This suggests that investing in cycling infrastructure is no good if driving is still perceived as easier. So how do we help more people to access cycling? The future of cycling design may well be using virtual reality to test out solutions. One company already providing this is Urban Future. They create models which simulate the cycling experience, allowing a designer to remotely cycle down a particular street or intersection as a child or as an older person to identify issues which may arise. To summarise, we should remember that cultural change takes time because people are often fearful of trying new things. However, if we give them confidence in the system by making cycling a fun and safe experience, then we can change the norm. If you take one thing away today, it should be that you can't design effective solutions without having cycled yourself. If you haven't got a bike, I would urge you to consider getting one. If you don't know how to ride, ask someone you know to teach you. The best way to make improvements is to immerse yourself in the social, sensory and spatial experience of active travel. You never know, you might even enjoy it. I will now pass on to Harry, who's going to discuss how to overcome accessibility issues in active travel. Hello, I'm Harry. I've got a geography and environmental science background and I'm currently researching the impacts of COVID on green space use. Looking at how electric bikes can enable accessibility, it's crucial to highlight some of the issues of active travel 
Firstly, is it available to all ages? Uh, is it available to all abilities? And are there costs involved? Well, e-bikes do have assisted power for longer distances and difficult topography. Uh, traffic engineering for cycling now is more disjointed, so e-bikes could help there. And the assisted power is also seen as a benefit when looked at cycling was chosen for a mode of transport to work due to its quickness. This wasn't due to environmental reasons. Um, when they are correctly located, they are more easily accessible. There's also funding available to lower the costs involved, so it is a utilisable option. Uh, in Nice, the south of France, their e-bike scheme really helped to enable accessibility. It's formed of 175 stations, 1700 bikes, and you're always within 300 metres of one. It utilises the, the waterfront and the promenade and helps to access them. But it's the simplicity of design, the branding and its marketing that helped to really create an identity of the bikes. And this has helped to create an identity of the city overall itself. Looking at how bicycle hubs can also help to enable accessibility. Um, firstly, some issues of active travel again are water availability, uh, bicycle repair, places to rest when you're out and about. Uh, and dry bicycle storage locations. Bicycle hubs, they're service providers that can vary and range from a simple place to store a bike or a place to get a coffee, fill up a water bottle. Really, they've just got different functions based upon what their need is. But when located at a strategic location, they can really help to provide assistance when trying to travel around a city. An example of bicycle hubs um, could be looked at as in Craigie in Perth. This is a case study. Um, it's an area that's really challenged by topography as shown in the visual. Blue star highlights where the train station is. So with that challenging topography in mind, the four red squares show the proposed locations where bike hubs could go in this neighbourhood. Um, they were chosen for their green spaces, they were outdoor recreation areas and their proximity to services. Essentially, they were selected at these four locations to allow people to travel into the city, um, but also for people coming from the city to travel out and then access the, the near countryside for this city centre. So what are some take home points for enabling accessibility? Well, correct selection of location uh, is paramount, as well as making sure that the function meets the needs and wants of that local population. The first impression from use does really matter, so it's vital to make sure they're implemented effectively first time round. It's also crucial that the infrastructure around it can support the e-bike scheme and the bike hubs, but also that is not just an infrastructure to be used, it can also help to create an identity for a city. Hello everyone, my name is Martin Walker and today I'm going to be talking about comfortable streets. My background is in geography and I've just recently joined a local authority as a development management planner. I have previous experience of research into active travel projects as a geographer. My current interest is blue and green infrastructure, with a particular focus on the aspect of amenity within sustainable urban drainage systems. Given that the topic of the event is walking and cycling to stations, I've chosen here two examples of train stations in Scotland which demonstrate the challenges for creating comfortable streets. Dundee's train station is newly refurbished, yet you have to cross several lanes of traffic just to get to the entrance, meaning that access by walking or cycling is not particularly safe or attractive. The image on the right is King's Place in Perth, which leads directly into Perth train station. The street doesn't appear to be welcoming or provide nearly enough space that would actually be required if walking and cycling to the station was truly a viable way of making the journey there. If access by walking and cycling to stations is to be encouraged, how can this realistically take place in spaces like these? Rotterdam Central Station in the Netherlands is a great example of what a comfortable street looks like. The main aspects of creating the sense of comfort is space, safety, attractiveness, activity and connectivity, all of which are themes being discussed in this presentation. This demonstrates that collaborative thinking and design is required to deliver these spaces. You can see that Rotterdam has achieved this comfort by creating lots of space for pedestrians, limiting vehicles and using green spaces to increase the attractiveness of the area and provide pleasure for those using the spaces. The Sheffield Great Green project is the UK's largest retrofit sustainable drainage system and demonstrates how existing monotonous grey roads can be transformed into attractive multifunctional green space. The project converted what was previously an inner city dual carriageway into an area which provides safe passage and recreational areas for pedestrians 
as well as managing surface water flooding and enhancing biodiversity. The evidence shows that having access to these green spaces is positive for health and well-being across all ages, especially in light of the pandemic, which has increased the demand for access to these spaces. The multiple benefits that green and blue infrastructure can offer has led to increased focus on how they are designed and perceived to maximise the positive physical, mental and practical outcomes that the public can benefit from. The Glasgow M8 underpass shows how a simple change of colour and retrospective design can make an area feel much more comfortable. The strong vibrant colours and unique phoenix flowers, as they are called, illuminate at night, providing a pleasant walking and cycling experience at all times of day for an area which would otherwise go unnoticed and likely avoided. Applying the principles of comfortable streets in our own work, these images are from our urban design project in different neighbourhoods of Perth. These demonstrate how artwork and lighting can enhance safety and connectivity between previously disconnected urban areas and also contribute to a sense of place by acknowledging the cultural heritage of the area which is integrated into the design. Building upon the idea of lighting and safety, I will now pass over to Connor, who will explore these topics in more detail. Hello, my name is Connor McKinley. I'm a forensic psychobiology graduate with interests in safety and lighting in the urban environment, along with improving suburbia and public art. When it comes to fear within the built environment, it is important to first understand the subconscious cues humans use to determine the safety of it. One well-established theory of this is called Prospect Refuge Theory and was devised by Jay Appleton in 1975. It suggests that most species' basic needs are based on their ability to see and their ability to hide. The extent to which the environment offers these features affects how comfortable a person feels within it. For example, it's why you may naturally feel more comfortable sitting in booths rather than at an open table in the middle of the restaurant. Within this theory, researchers have identified three important cues that we use to determine the safety of an environment, prospect, concealment and entrapment. Prospect is the extent to which a person's field of view is unobstructed, while concealment refers to the extent to which potential threats are offered a place to hide, such as bushes, walls and shadows. And entrapment refers to the presence of physical barriers that prevent escape in case of emergency. These three cues are important factors in safety perceptions and has received much support with other studies showing that environments with high prospect and low levels of concealment and entrapment are associated with lower levels of fear of crime. Now with perceptions of safety, there tends to be gender differences. Gender is a consistent predictor of fear of crime, with many studies noting that women typically have lower perceptions of safety in public space and public transport than men. Research shows that trains in particular are very fear-inducing to women at night due to, due to the confined nature of the carriages, which illustrates the effects of entrapment, and the fewer commuters and staff. Unstaffed stations and underpasses en route can also exacerbate this and force women to take less convenient routes to get to train stations. The behavioural consequences of this is that people, particularly women, will avoid areas perceived as unsafe. They will abstain from going out when dark and travelling alone as well. This disproportionately limits women's freedom to enjoy public space and use public transport. So how does this inform walking and cycling to and from train stations? Well, to encourage active travel to these transport hubs, it's important that we help to improve perceptions of safety amongst everyone in society and reduce the gender fear gap. And a good way to make places feel safer is by attracting more people to them to facilitate natural surveillance and to animate the area. Initially, however, it can be hard to provide sufficient density across urban centres to aid with this. Therefore, by concentrating activity in what we can call safe corridors, we can provide adequate activity of people along them through the implementation of mixed-use space along the way. Now, following McCormack's hierarchy of transactions, having street markets, bars and restaurants along these safe corridors would increase interaction with the public space and draw in the density required to provide sufficient natural surveillance and to improve perceptions of safety. Now, as well as peopling these corridors, effective lighting, well-maintained ground floor plinths and facades, clean streets and dedicated cycle space that is separate from traffic all influence the effectiveness of the corridors in improving feelings of safety, especially amongst women whose perception of safety can be heavily influenced by them. 
While increasing things like CCTV, the presence of law enforcement and the implementation of shutters can help reduce the actuality of crime, too high a, con too high a concentration can actually create the impression of a hostile environment and therefore should be done in moderation along these corridors so that perceptions of safety are not damaged by them. If safe corridors can be created to train stations, then walking and cycling to them during both the day and night can be encouraged and facilitated, not just with women, but for everyone. So that was just fantastic contributions from the um, Dundee University students there. I'm just so grateful to them. And I think there was some, some really, you know, as regards what we're talking about here this evening, I think some really valuable sort of summarising ideas, the idea of space, safety, attractiveness, activity and, and connectivity. I think it's really useful.